with me before I begin my message of mission and power. Lord, open our eyes and our hearts to the truth that is contained here in your word. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Uh, I'd like to back up a little bit from what I have in the, in the bulletin as far as the scripture goes to and read from um, verse 36 in chapter 24 of Luke. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn and uh, follow along with me, please do that. While they were still taking, talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe, believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. We just celebrated Easter, and what an awesome celebration that is to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. But don't we do that every week? Every Sunday, don't we come together to celebrate the joy of the resurrection and the life that we have in Christ, and even on a daily basis? So how do we know that Jesus rose from the dead? Was it the empty tomb? You know, how do we know? Well, one of the ways that we know, or the main ways that we know that Jesus rose from the dead was because he appeared to his disciples. And Jesus, this message of Jesus' appearance to the disciples, and this passage, um, verses 47 to 49, we would refer to as the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is, is, is present in all four of the Gospels and also in Acts where Jesus talks about going and sharing. But in each one of those Gospels, the Gospel writers wanted to be sure that people, that the disciples understood that Jesus was not a ghost, that he was a human being, that he was a physical body. They were able, he, he was able to show them the scars in his hands. And they were able to touch that and to, to put their fingers into those wounds and into his side. He was able to walk for miles. He was able to converse. And he was able to eat. He says to the disciples, do you have something that I can eat? And he ate broiled fish in, in their presence. His body was, had physical aspects. It was flesh and bone. But 
he also was different. His body was different. His resurrected body looked like the body that he had prior to being resurrected, but this body was immortal. It didn't have any bounds. It had no physical, physical bounds. He was able to kind of go through space and time differently than, than he did when he was in human form. So when Jesus appeared to the disciples, he gave them some instructions. And he gave them a command and he gave them a promise. The command was repentance and forgiveness, forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And the promise that he gave was I am going to send you what my father has promised, the Holy Spirit. So here we see the mission. Jesus describes his mission for his disciples. And he describes his power, the power through which that is going to be accomplished. Each one of the, the versions of the Great Commission that are in the Gospels contain four points. The first is that there is a commandment to preach, witness, and teach. The second is teaching the content of the good news, repentance and forgiveness. The third is it's to be preached to all nations, to all people. And there's a special focus on Gentiles, to focus on the, that group of people. And then finally, a mention of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's work in this ministry. So Jesus gave this command to his disciples. Is this a command for us? You betcha. This is a command for us too. Jesus commands us in, in for his mission and his power to share the gospel and accomplish that great commission. So what is the message? You know, we're called to proclaim the message of repentance and forgiveness. Has anyone in this room had their lives, lives transformed by the, the gospel of Jesus Christ? <laughs> the gospel transforms lives. Jesus, the, through his power, makes us new. And we need to look at repentance and forgiveness. What does it mean to repent. Well, repentance is turning from going the wrong way. It is a deliberate change of mind or change of direction. When we repent, we change our focus. We change our focus from having it be on ourselves and on worldly things to a focus on the things of God. That's repentance. The goal in all of that is Christ-likeness. That's what we're all striving for. That's our bar that we're trying to achieve. We're trying to become Christ-like. And forgiveness. God has given us forgiveness through, the, through his son, the death of his son who, who bore all of our sins when he hung on the cross and died for each and every one of us. If, if, if there was only one of us, if there was only one person, Jesus would have died for that person's sin. But repentance and forgiveness need to go together. There's a decision and a determination to put Jesus first. And we recognize that no one is sinless. Anyone in here without sin? No. You know, sometimes we think of like huge sins, like murder or, you know, robbery or whatever. 
Um, but we all need God's continual forgiveness and grace. We all need God's forgiveness. So who are we supposed to give this message to? Well, I've already mentioned, this message is for all people. God's message of repentance and forgiveness is for all people. And where did he tell the disciples to start sharing this message? In Jerusalem, right? Begin in Jerusalem. Right where they were at. Okay, so our message here at Bowmansdale is we need to be starting right where we're at in giving this message, in spreading the gospel, in talking about Jesus. And maybe that's in our workplace. Maybe that's in school. Maybe that's in, you know, when we're out, you know, when we see somebody in need, you know, out in, in the area, whatever. Eventually, God's mission is that his message would be spread to the entire world. But for right now, it has to start here. It has to start with us. So how do we do it? Have you ever tried or have you ever experienced somebody um, who maybe was trying to, to share the gospel with you, but it was more like they were... It was a notch on their belt that they had that they had maybe tried to lead someone to Christ or whatever. Anyone ever experienced that? When I was in when I was in college, and this is going to date me, um, when I was in college, um, Penn State University had one computer, and it probably took up a room the size of this congregation. And we had all these little cards that we took around and and collected to put together um, our schedule for a semester. And you could have had, I could have had eight cards in my little file and then I, I would go to a class that I didn't, that I um, needed and it wasn't available when I was available. So then I would have to shuffle everything again and, and go back and trade cards and all ever. So it was a very, very stressful, stressful kind of a situation. And <clears throat> so, and I'm sure that the Campus for Crusade for Christ folks had good intentions in their heart. I'm certain of that. I'm certain their motives were, were, were good and true and whatever. But that was the wrong time. That was the wrong time for them to come up to me and want to share the gospel with me. Because it was just a very, very, very difficult time. So the timing, the timing has to be right. And when we're sharing the message, it's not a generalized message of repentance and forgiveness, but it's a message that is proclaimed in his name, meaning on the basis of the name of Jesus. So when we are presenting the gospel, when we're talking to people about Jesus, First, we need to be connected with all that Jesus is and has done. We want to connect that message with all that he has said and done. And to let them know that forgiveness is available only through Jesus. And then second, to preach in his name means to proclaim in his authority and in his power. There is authority and power in Jesus' name. Has anyone ever been in a conversation where somebody starts talking about Jesus outside of the church and all of a sudden it's like, whew. It gets silent. It gets silent. Because we're comfortable in our culture talking about God. Everybody's okay with God. You can mention God God, God, God. But when you mention Jesus, there's a silence. Because there's power. There's power in the name of Jesus. And one of the best examples of 
accomplishing a healing or work in Jesus' name is in Acts 3, where Peter um, goes up to the lame beggar. I think John was with him. Peter and John go up to the lame beggar. And the lame beggar locks eye contact with Peter, thinking, you know, Peter is going to give him money. And Peter says to him, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. What happened? He got up and he walked. And not only did he walk, he jumped and he danced. And a crowd gathered because they all knew who this beggar was who sat outside the gate, beautiful. They'd seen him. And he was walking. And Peter, Peter declares, By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see, you see and know, was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Jesus' name was how he was healed. But then what happened? Peter got arrested. Peter got arrested. And he was taken before the Sanhedrin to account for these actions that he had performed. And he is asked by the Sanhedrin, by what power or what name did you do this? And filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter says, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. And talking of Jesus, he is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. You know, for those, if, you, if you've not ever seen a capstone or know what a capstone is, the capstone in an arch is the middle stone that holds it together. And if the capstone is absent, what happens to the arch? It, it collapses. Jesus is the capstone. And Peter goes on and says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. Jesus concludes his commission with the declaration that you are witnesses of these things. Peter witnessed the power of Christ. Peter's spirit-anointed message is an example of what Jesus meant when he said that his disciples would be witnesses. Are these, are these things, is this power, power that we also have accessible to us? Yes. Yes, this is this same power we have accessible to us. How else? In his name, but also in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I am going to send you what the Father has promised. But then he says, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. You know, a parallel message to this is in, comes from Acts first, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, where Jesus says, on one occasion, or where the scripture says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John the Baptist baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, when do we, when do we receive the Holy Spirit? If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you have received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. 
We preach, we witness, we teach in the power of the Holy Spirit. Many, many times in Scripture, it talks about, primarily in the Old Testament, talks about, God says, I will pour out my Spirit in Isaiah, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And a passage you've probably heard from Joel, chapter 2, verse 28. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Pouring out of God's Spirit. The pouring out of the, the Holy Spirit is like being clothed with supernatural power. Have you ever had an experience where you're, you're talking with somebody and, and you, you sense that God wants you to share with them? God wants you to do something might, that might appear to be scary? What, what's your response? Fearful? You know, someone said to me once that when the Holy Spirit prompts you to talk to somebody, you are never the first witness. Never. The Holy Spirit has always gone before to prepare the heart and the mind of that person. So we don't need to be fearful. If we're hearing from God, we have no reason to fear. Unless we're doing it of our own will and our own power. Which I had an experience with that too. I myself, when I was in college, my sophomore year in college, I went to Colorado on a, on a, a trip to work at a Christian sports and family camp. I think I told you about this at one point. And I went through, I was going through the Chicago airport, and on my way out there, um, there were all of these Hare Krishna folks at the airport. And I didn't know what to say to them. And they were coming up to me and talking to me, but I didn't know what to say. And so, as I'm going through the airport, I just kind of, you know, was thinking, and when I got to Colorado, some of the girls that were roommates of mine were had this book on cults. And so I thought, ah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read that book. I'm gonna read especially about Hare Krishna, and I'm gonna figure out how I can make a difference when I go back through the Chicago airport. Because, you know, I know that I can, you know, I can share Christ with them. I, I, I. So, God has a sense of humor, I think. And so I get back to, the, hair, to the, um, the Chicago airport, and there are lots of Hare Krishna there. Not one approached me. Not one. But it's because my motives were wrong. I wasn't closed with the Holy Spirit. You know, I was not, I didn't, I wasn't going forward with the, the power of God, with the power of the Holy Spirit. I was going through, forward on my own power, trying to accomplish something in my own power. So when the Spirit comes, His power becomes like our clothing. And it's a metaphor for all of us, we're disciples, and, it's, and we will take on the characteristics and the virtues, the intentions of the Spirit. So we're clothed in the Spirit. And Jesus, in his message, is clear that the power is not the disciples' own. That the power that they have comes from on high. Their power comes from the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus commands and promises were not only for his apostles, but they were also for us today. We are 
are commanded to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim his message of repentance and forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. We are commanded to declare this to all people groups, eventually through, throughout the world. We are witnesses to what we know about Jesus, his power, his authority, the forgiveness of sins, to go forward in his name under the power of his Holy Spirit. And we have to wait before God until he gives us the power of the Spirit, the power that is not in us until it comes from him. I have a quote from a pastor and an author, Ralph E. Wilson. And he says, There is a sense in which the spirit-led mission of declaring the gospel to the whole world is center stage and time critical for God's purpose in our day. Two verses come to mind. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And as you look forward to the day of God and speed his coming. He says, in, if indeed the timing of Jesus' return hinges upon us preaching the gospel fully, then we, then we must be about our duty. Come, Lord Jesus. Please pray with me. Father, you have given us a great commission. You've provided clear and direct instruction for this mission. And you've given us access to the power that is needed in accomplishing it. Give us the opportunities and the courage to share the good news in your name through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.